good evening on behalf of Veterans and Politics. I want to thank you for coming. i uh, just give you a background or uh, uh, overview of this process, Tony. So basically, each of the panel members will uh, give a 30-second introduction of ourselves. After that, you'll have a minute and a half to introduce yourself, what office you're running for, why. And then after that, we'll start asking you questions. And after we ask you a question, then you have a minute and a half to respond to that. At the end of that question and answer period, then we'll give you two minutes for a closing statement uh, in which you can say whatever else you need to say and give your uh, campaign contact information. So I'll start. I'm Jim Jonas. I'm the director of Veterans of Politics, and I also co-host the podcast with Steve Sanson. Hi, my name is Talicia Sandoval. I'm currently a student at UNLV, a political science major and pre-law. I also happen to work for Sherrell Mendenhall. My name is Amber Johnson, and I'm a family court activist. Okay, Tony, did you want to start with your introduction, please? All right. My name is Tony Palmer. Uh, I'm uh, running for Nevada Assembly District Number 7. A lot of reasons why I'm running for Assembly District 7 is, uh, well, my opponent has done nothing. He's the incumbent. And last session, all he did was just rubber stamp anything. He had no ideas about what needs to be fixed, no ideas what needs to be done in the future. Uh, all he did was just a rubber stamp. Uh, if you asked him a question, like some of the newspapers did, he says, I don't have any thoughts or ideas. I'll, I'll figure it out after I get elected. After he got elected, he did nothing. And I'm out here running for office because there's things that I want to do. Main thing I'm looking for is I truly want to help Nevadans. I'm a retired police sergeant, had 30 years on the Virginia Beach Police Department. I empathize with victims like anything. Every single day I dealt with victims. And that's what my job is when I go into the assembly is help victims, help Nevadans, make this uh, state much better, keep our taxes down, uh, if not even reduce them, and just make it a better place. Okay. All right, Tony. Um, thank you again for coming in this evening. And just so everybody knows, I have interviewed Tony before. Um, okay, so you said your opponent hasn't done anything. So as a newly elected uh, assembly person, I, you can introduce five BDR's budget draft requests. Can you give me a list of, it doesn't have to be five, but... Just give me a list of your BDRs that you want to propose and why. Okay, well, I know we are limited to five as a new assembly person. Uh, I actually have 11 in no particular order because everything is just as important as the other. Uh, election integrity, hugely important to me. I believe that we have to get rid of this mail-in voting stuff without cause. If you have cause, like you're disabled, uh, military, whatever, uh, mail-in voting is fine. But regular people, they go to the ballots just like I've gone for the last 45 years. I mean, there's, there's no reason why you can't uh, be on the ballots. Ballot harvesting has to be made a felony again. Uh, again, the, it's ridiculous to allow somebody to bring 20, 30, 50 ballots to an election bureau. Uh, you know, a family member could do that. That's fine. And again, for a disabled person. But so election integrity would be number one. Uh, next thing is crime is starting to get out of hand. Some judges are too soft. OK, now in Virginia, believe it or not, the police officer prosecutes everything from the time. I don't care if they write a parking ticket, arrest somebody for a suspended license or arrest them for homicide. That police officer is involved the entire way in court. And I could easily spend 60, 80 hours in court for a major court case as the arresting police officer out here. Obviously, it's a different system. It goes through the DA and the courts have a dis different system. But the problem is, is that when a police officer was prosecuting this, you could actually have ownership of the case, see it forward from the start to the end. Because there's no ownership with it, a lot of major cases are reduced down where the defendant 
as even though they might be guilty, they get no jail time. So what my second priority would be mandatory jail with no suspended time for certain things, such as use of a firearm illegally in the commission of a crime, speeding 40 miles an hour over the speed limit, uh, second, third, fourth offense DUI, felony convictions, uh, required reporting prosecution of school assaults, uh, assaults over the age of 13. Drug dealers, fentanyl dealers, mandatory jail time, non-suspended. Uh, I support the uh, Stand Your Ground uh, doctrine and also animal abuse, make that a felony. I understand that am animals are property. I'm the owner of three German Shepherds. I probably owned 20 dogs in my lifetime. I love animals. Out here, I understand animals are property, but if you abuse them, that would be a felony. And based on that abuse, you'd have mandatory jail time. Uh, Another uh, thing very important for me is police, uh, state police, which is what the assembly would control, need higher pay and more benefits. State police only make about a third of what a local police officer makes. They can't retain them on the job. We have to pay these folks what they're worth, give them better benefits. Uh, more funding for the crime lab. People don't realize this. I, I, I couldn't believe this when I came here. The crime lab is so backed up that they're looking at, and I use as an example, rape kits, 20 years old, and they're finding out who the suspect is. Now, the problem with that is the victim could have died, the perpetrator could have died, or there's this thing called chain of custody, okay? If a person that was involved in that chain of custody dies, there's no case. The detective could have died. I mean, any, any break in that chain of custody, you have no case. And 20 years is too much. We have to fund the crime lab more. Uh, more funding for training. When you look at one police department with 1,000 officers, if you have to train them, it's going to take uh, probably over a million dollars just for two or three days worth of training. Because officers need overtime. You have to call them in on their days off. You have the expense of the trainers, the equipment. Bullets are outrageously expensive right now. Uh, police departments can't do that. You, you talk that you want police officers to pro be proficient in firearms training, et cetera. Got to practice. OK, bullets cost money, a lot of money. And another thing for police is protect what's called qualified immunity. Again, people don't know what qualified immunity is. What qualified immunity means in a nutshell is if the police officer does what's known as the best police practices, does everything right that police officer would be exempt from a civil liability. If the uh, defendant wants to try to sue in the future, they sue the city, the county, the state, whomever, and they have their own attorneys. But the police officer would not be held liable if that officer does the best proper practices. OK, uh, and, and just as an example, just said anybody that's watching this will get an example. Let's say I have a non-eventful arrest. It's just for a warrant. And so I go and I put my handcuffs on the person. I'm friendly with them. They're friendly with me. Put them back in the police car. It's all on video. Everybody's happy and all. We're smiling and joking and all. And I release them over to the jail. Uh, Eleven months later, he wants to sue me because he has numbness in his finger because the handcuffs were on. I don't remember who this guy is because I arrested him on a warrant, was uneventful. I don't even have his name written down in a notebook. Next thing you know, I'd have to hire an attorney. I'd have to go to court, take time off from work to protect myself or hire, uh, have insurance on myself. But that's what qualified immunity protects you against. Uh, there's so many things. Um, limit the governor's emergency powers. Every governor needs an emergency power. Uh, that's the bottom line. If, God forbid, there's a major earthquake, uh, I know we really don't have floods or anything else, governors all need emergency powers, but they have to be limited. They can't be endless, can't be a monarchy. You can't have emergency powers for a year, two years, three years without legislators, such as the assembly folks in the state senate, saying, okay, we're going to give you an extension. Okay.
Okay, thank you, Tony. Um, so I guess uh, my next question would be, is there anything, what are the main concerns in Assembly 7? Because obviously security and safety is what I'm hearing from all that, pretty much every assembly level right now. But all you were talking about was security. What, um, what else do you want to address as an assembly person? Or is that going to be just your main key issue? Well, that, that would be number, number one, because if people don't feel safe and secure and we don't get criminals off of the street, if we just release them right back, they're not safe. So safety is number one thing, okay? The next thing that would come about is you have to be able to afford things, all right? Rising inflation is coming up. There's no reason why we can't reduce taxes instead of increase them, which goes to the citizens, all right, so, and then of course, then the third thing is a lot of people are parents and we need safe schools, school choice for our children. And uh, th there's a lot of things compromising in reference to schools, but that's our future. If a student is afraid to go to school, they're not gonna learn. So I guess my, my you seem very prepared, which I appreciate very much, um, but what my question would be is, basically why you and why us? So why do you, why is this endor endorsement important to you? And why do you feel that you're best qualified for this but job? Why is what's so important? The, the endorsement from us. So yeah. the endorsement from oh. us. So um, why do you feel that you are best qualified for this job? And then also why do you, why is this endorsement important to you? Well, integrity is the first thing. Okay, integrity, uh, experience, life experience, and honesty. Okay, I mean, it, it's a lot of things. Uh, integrity, my opponent has never worked. Okay, uh, he filed what's called the CE report, contribution and expense report, and it shows that he even collected unemployment the last two years. On his previous one, he's never held the job. His income is rental income from a vacant lot. How do you put that down as income, okay? We're talking integrity here. And then you collect unemployment, I guess, because he wasn't employed by the assembly once he stopped going up to Carson City, okay? You have to be honest about things. Uh, there's a lot of things about him that isn't honest. And uh, there's been a lot of checks on him, and I'll, I'll just leave it at that until it comes out. But uh, integrity, honesty, and experience. I have life experience. Uh, I'm going almost 64 years old. Uh, I lived in New York City for 27 years. I lived in Virginia Beach for 30. I've lived out here now for seven years. And I just have a lot of experiences with life. Uh, I'm married. I have uh, four children. I have four grandchildren. And these are all things that kind of draw you into it. Uh, he has two children, never been married, and, well, I'll just leave it at that with uh, other issues with him. The second part of that question is why is this endorsement so important to you? Oh, it, it's extremely important. Uh, veterans are honorable, honorable people, just like police officers, okay? They served our nation. Uh, as a police officer, you're serving your city, uh, your state, and... Uh, they have to see that I'm out there working for veterans, working for the state, working for the city. That's what I'm doing. That's what an assembly person should do, not working for themselves. Um, what is your take on, sorry. What is your take on mental illness and anything that you can do to help bring that to the attention as because you did discuss safety as far as our, our students in schools and that has been something that's on the rise. Okay, I, I have family members that have mental health issues. I also have friends that so it is very important for me and unfortunately people don't think of it as being uh, an actual disease or problem. Um, if I walked in here and I didn't have a leg or an arm you'd say, okay, that person's handicapped. But if somebody, let's say, is bipolar, they've been diagnosed, they're on medication, you can't see it. You might see that person react and say, wow, what's up with that person? But 
you can't physically see that bipolar, such as if I was an amputee. Uh, so yes, we have to keep on extending benefits, more progress with providing funding for them to help these folks to get the treatment that they need, which obviously so many aren't. And uh, because it's real, it's real. Like I said, I have family and friends that have mental health issues, and these definitely have to be helped. All right, believe it or not, this is probably the toughest question you're gonna get asked. What are the boundaries of your assembly district? Those are fun to explain. Okay, uh, well, it's actually a little bit easier than before. Uh, it's kind of like a long rectangle. Uh, let's start at Rancho Drive, and we'll go from, uh, what is that, uh, um, Craig Road, and from Craig Road, go up to Lone Mountain, and it kind of trails off a little bit, but it goes uh, a little bit past uh, North Fifth Street. So it's almost a long rectangle. Okay, I, I wanted to ask that because it's always fun to try to explain that because it always looks like some crazy jigsaw yeah, puzzle. Yeah, and it's actually, um, I have a picture of the map here, by the way, and it, uh, it's actually um, a little bit of Las Vegas and a lot of North Las Vegas, and that's in green. And that would be my district map. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, which is probably another tough question, believe it or not, what, and this is the number one question I hear, what does an assemblyman do? What does the assembly? What is the role of an assemblyman? Okay, well, that, that's actually very easy. People don't understand. You would understand being a law student. Uh, you're in what's called the legislature. Okay, uh, with the way that's divided up with Nevada, there's 21 state senators and 42 assembly persons, which make up a legislator. What the legislator means is to legislate means make laws. That's basically what they do, okay? In a nutshell, they make laws. It could be anything from uh, building highway funding. You know, we're gonna make a law to accept highway funding. We're gonna make a law to uh, give state police more money. We're gonna make a law to do, you know, whichever. We're gonna uh, make a law to uh, mandatory jail term, all right? That's what you do, you legislate. You're making rules and laws. And uh, that's it in a nutshell. Obviously, if I was to write a book, it would probably be about that thick about what legislators do, but that's it in, in a nutshell. Okay, so my next question then is, when you, uh, when you get elected, are you gonna be willing to be the voice in the assembly to keep things moving along correctly? I'll give you an example. So last legislative session, there was 185 NRS statutes passed. Three got passed in the first 58 days. The 182 got passed in the last two. Now, I find it hard to believe that 182 NRS codes were properly read and understood in two days. Will you be willing to uh, push back on your caucus members and say, hey, we need to start getting this stuff moving along or just stop passing so many darn laws to begin with? No, you're going to have to read each proposed law line by line and make sure everything is good. You, you can't just be handed a book and say, OK, let's go and vote on this right now. Uh, everything has to be uh, read, absorbed, and at which point then you could make a valid vote. Because if you don't, that was kind of like when they passed Obamacare. They, they said, here it is, and we'll tell you what's in it later on. Go and pass it. And, uh, you know, you, you don't pass laws like that without at least digesting it and reading it, absorbing it, and then giving a full opinion on it. If you say, I don't like what's on page 138, get rid of it, okay? But, yeah, you, you have to read and absorb everything. And, and plus, you go and you talk with the other assembly people. Because, as you say, each person could only... Uh, put so many uh, laws that they would like passed. And of course, things go into committee. And so you go and you, you talk with the other legislators and say, hey, look, you know, you put this thing down about, let's argument sake, say the mining tax. Let's talk about this. What do you, what do you want with this mining tax? What are the pros, pros and cons? Let's talk. So, sorry, would you be willing, is this on? 
Okay. Would you be willing to not, because again, this is not just about making laws. It's also about repealing them and, and changing things as well. Um, would you be willing to stand up to your constituents and say, Hey, like this is not necessary anymore. Or maybe I feel that a certain way about this is something that maybe everybody around you advocates for strongly. Oh, very definitely. My, my constituents, obviously, they're going to be very important for me, okay? And just as everybody is around the state, everybody depends on their on the group of assembly persons as a whole. But, of course, my constituents, and I have one of the highest crime areas in the state in my district. And like I said, my constituents are going to want to be safe. They're going to want, want to look at good schools. I look at the school violence that's happening out there. A lot of it's at my schools in my district. Okay. The parents want the children to be safe. The children want to be safe. They want them to get educated. You know, when they walk out of the house, they don't want to get assaulted. So, yes. Yeah, so I, I'm going to be held culpable to my constituents. Good. Thank you. Um, so less about I know that you're not on the school board or anything like that, but in terms of school safety, what do you think the route to fix and or um, remedy the situation might be? OK, well, apparently a lot of the schools, they weren't prosecuting for assaults and crimes in the school. Now, I understand if a child is under 12 something to that effect, they're not a teenager. They're not as culpable, okay? Uh, you know, an eight-year-old kicks a teacher in the ankle. Don't expel them, okay? We, we have to, you know, give that kid, you know, some type of counseling. But I, I go and I see these things, case in point, all right? This disgusted me when I heard it. We just recently had that teacher that was assaulted, raped, brutalized, okay? And I don't know if the news feed cut a lot of things off, but what they had was was a counselor and the counselor said yes we're going to have to give this 15 year old boy some counseling and i'm thinking to myself oh my god what about the victim this woman is going to be a victim for the rest of her life okay it's going to affect her for the rest of her life let's talk about counseling her giving her what she needs because she's not going to be working anytime soon i guarantee you okay get her the help prosecute this 15 year old to the fullest extent of the law. And then when he gets out of jail in 20, 30, 40 years, then we'll get him some counseling. OK, but you have to look for the victims. And so that goes with everything with school. We have to look at prosecuting or expelling students that do any type of crime on school grounds. And again, I don't know what's considered school grounds out here, but I know that when in Virginia, uh, walking to or from school or a bus stop. Can confirm that is also the same law. That is here. school Correct. grounds. Yeah. Great. So, so that's it, though. I mean, anything happens on school grounds should be reported because a lot isn't reported. It's kept in house. I don't know why. And then prosecuted if you're 13 or above. All right, my next question. We tried to, well, not me in particular, but Steve Sanson really, really pushed for this. And I, I agree 100% with uh, the bill he proposed. Unfortunately, it did die in committee. But it's, uh, it's a bill, it's called remove or retain. And this only pertains to incumbent judges uh, that run unopposed. And lots of times they run unopposed for the reason it's very simple. Like attorneys don't want to oppose the sitting judge because they might, you know, come in front of them and then and there'll be backlash for it. Right. So remove and retain is a bill that if a sitting judge runs for re-election, doesn't draw an opponent, right? So what then happens is it still goes to the voters, but then if the voters can decide, do we remove this judge or do we retain this judge? If they choose to remove the judge, okay, then it goes, the Judicial Appointment Committee takes applications, 
And then they send three recommendations to the governor, and then the governor would appoint someone to fill that seat. Is that something when you become a, an, a, an assembly person, would you be willing to support that bill? Sorry about that. We had some problems with Facebook Live. So, Tony, do you want me to repeat, remove, and retain? In case it got cut off, certainly. Okay. So... Steve and Veterans of Politics have proposed a bill called Remove or Retain. So essentially the way it works is if an incumbent judge runs unopposed, and lots of times that happens here in the state because attorneys are afraid to run against that judge for, you know, they don't want that judge picking on them, you know, if they come in front of them again. So then on the ballot, it would have Remove or Retain. So if the voters say Retain, and that wins, then the judge keeps their seat. But if they vote remove, then it goes to the uh, Judicial Appointment Committee in which they select, everybody can, all, all the people that want to be judges, submit their application to the Judicial Appointment Committee, and then they pick three that they feel are best suited. Then those three go to the governor, and the governor actually picks the judge that's going to be in that seat. Uh, would you be willing to support that? Yes, I would. And as an example, as I said, I was a police sergeant, okay, Virginia Beach, 30 years. And in Virginia, you prosecute everything from a parking ticket to a homicide. Uh, you're directly involved with the entire court case from start to finish. And as an example, I believe that the year was maybe 1987. And we had a judge extremely unethical. And DUI was just starting to become a thing. Uh, per se, DUI was a 0.15 at the time. And we had a defendant in court. Uh, I was there. And the uh, defendant came in to the continuance line and he was totally drunk. And the police officer that had charged him said, Your Honor, he's intoxicated right now. The judge laid into the police officer for doing that. And he let the man take a continuance. Technically, he should have been in contempt of court because a, a person can't file a motion if they're intoxicated. He should have been put contempt of court, 24 hours, come back tomorrow when you're not intoxicated. That's proper protocol, at least in Virginia. Police officers, myself included, followed him out of the courtroom, put his key in the ignition, at which point we brought him right back in before the judge and said, he's DUI again. He put his key in the ignition. OK, gave him a breathalyzer. Uh, the judge reprimanded the police officers, said, let him go. We filed a complaint through the state and that judge was promptly removed from the bench. OK. Certain judges overstepped their bounds. I had another judge that overstepped his bounds in taking not guilty pleas without me being there, which they're not allowed to do. They could take a guilty plea without the police officer there, such as a speedy trial or something, but they can't take a not guilty plea. And once I pointed out to several people along the way, that judge was retired within two months and he was on for 30 plus years. OK, so, yes, if there's unethical behavior, judges need to be removed, period. That's it. One of my questions is the um, how do you feel about course of control being possibly considered and added to uh, domestic violence uh, for what being controlled? Course of control. The abuse that psychological abuse that people suffer. That's not always physical. Oh, definitely. But it is becoming an epidemic, and some states are passing laws now to include that as domestic violence. Oh, 100%. Like I said, you know, the, that's very similar with mental health issues. It's something that you can't see. You can't grasp. If somebody gets punched in the face and you could see that black eye, you could say, I have that mental, uh, that domestic abuse. You, you got a broken arm. I got that domestic abuse. But you can't see the psychological abuse. Case in point, that uh, uh, poor child uh, that was recently found in a freezer, the mother of the child was mentally abused. She didn't say that there was any physical abuse other than being, if you would, handcuffed, not allowed to move around. But most of it was mental torture. 
Okay, that was mental abuse that she had. Uh, her own son was taken from her and abused and killed. All right, and, and that's mental abuse. And that's what this controlling, I think, boyfriend or whatever did to her. Okay, I mean, he just controlled her so much that he probably broke her down psychologically that uh, uh, she was unable to help herself or her own children. And so, yes, 100%, I believe in that. Again, I, I, I am a victim advocate, okay? If you're a victim of a criminal, the big thing is we should care about the victims, not about the criminal. And I'd just like to go one more step on in reference to this. Again, life experience, okay? I have a lot of life experience. When I was in high school, I was athlete of the year. I was a gymnast. I was a long distance runner. I was a wrestler for four years. I could have gotten a scholarship, okay? A lady with a suspended license, no insurance, this is the days before no fault insurance, runs a stop sign, uh, bringing your grandchildren to school, and after that I got a broken back where I walked like Groucho Marx for over a year, couldn't afford any meds, all right? And all she's saying is, well, I'm on welfare, what are you gonna do, put me in jail? And it's like, you know, she's the victim, it's like, a 17 year old that lives on his own, putting himself through high school and college is the victim, okay? You know, you think to yourself, oh, it's no big deal, somebody with a suspended license and no insurance. Uh, yes, it is a big deal, because if you get into an accident, you're gonna have a victim. You know, it, it's all about the victims, and that's who I, I'm concerned with. So I think to kind of uh, ever so slightly disagree with that point, I am personally a, a victim of, of child abuse at one point, not anymore, but I was. Um, and that mental abuse is, you, you can see it, it's visual. I mean, you can see it on the person and the way that they walk, the way that they talk, the way that they carry themselves. And of course, it's, it's not always as black and white as a broken arm, and I completely agree with that. Um, but we were talking in the case of domestic violence, but I wanna talk about children because that's something that's near and dear to me. It's something that I went through. Um, and I think that the child court or family court system and CPS doesn't do their job in a sense that they al allow or I guess are not aware of things slipping underneath the radar. So what would you do in this position? And again, not everything is under your control and, and as assembly, but um, to prevent that from happening. Well, you could never prevent things from happening. They're, they're, they're gonna happen, that's, that's the bottom line. I mean, that's why we have criminals. All you could do is once something is recognized, stop it and try to you know, help the victim and try to do something to the abuser, okay? Uh, and again, every circumstance is different. I've encountered thousands of abuse cases as a police officer. I mean, they run the gamut from uh, smacking the kid on the butt to doing unspeakable things, okay? I've, I've seen everything, uh, so that's where you need through the state probably more funding for the commission for these type of abuses to get treatment for the victim and prosecute the offenders. And again, I'm a big believer in mandatory jail time. Mandatory jail time, because too many subjects will get reduced jail time, uh, weeks, hours, a month, I mean, it's ludicrous for the crimes that they commit. They need to know you do this, you're gonna get sent away. And it's not gonna be at a judge's discretion because you know their mom says, oh, well, he was a polite son. It's like, uh, okay, <laughs> he was polite, who cares, all right? He has a victim, he, he's a bad person, he needs to go to jail. Okay, that's gonna end the question and answer portion of this. Uh, Tony, now you have uh, two minutes. Please look into the camera and just give your closing statement and please give your uh, campaign contact information out as well. Okay, well, again, I'm uh, Tony Palmer. I'm running for Nevada Assembly District 7. Uh, 
I'm looking to represent the constituents in my district and throughout the state. Uh, that's what it's about. Uh, I'm a firm believer in helping victims. I don't like uh, bad people. I want to keep our taxes down. I love our state. That's why when I retired, I moved out here to Nevada because it doesn't have a state income tax. My retirement has gone a lot longer uh, ways than it would have if I would have stayed in Virginia, much less even New York. Um, I want to uh, have an election integrity. I want to uh, put a referendum to stop abortion in the state. I understand that you can't, we can't pass a law, but we could put a referendum on the ballot. We need to fund state police more. And very important to a lot of parents is schools. We have to fund, school choice is actually a law. It has to be funded. We have to allow more charter schools. Uh, I don't know if assembly could do this, but I believe that we should break up CC, uh, CCSD. Uh, we're ranked, ever since I've lived out here, probably from 45 to 51 in the United States. And when somebody questioned me about 51, and I said, yes, they included D.C. I said, if you would have included Guam or uh, Samoa, you know, uh, uh, American Samoa, we probably would have been 52 or 53. Uh, you know, it's horrible. It just depends on the survey. We need better schools. Uh, that's the bottom line. Uh, no critical race theory should be taught in schools. We need to teach STEM classes. We need to teach uh, arithmetic, we need to teach history, uh, we need to teach science. Those are the type of things that we need to, uh, 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 to go and teach. And this is something, by the way, that uh, somebody had uh, brought to my attention I thought was really, really good. Uh, I'm the grandchild, great-grandchild of immigrants from Italy, okay? And when my grandfather moved here from Italy, obviously he didn't speak English, and he says, I'm not Italian anymore, I'm an American. And night school was given to him so he could learn English, okay? If you can't understand the main language of this country, which is English, you're not gonna assimilate into society. Uh, I met a young lady not too long ago, she may have interviewed with you, she's running for uh, uh, one of the uh, elections in this next time coming up, and she said that she didn't speak English, I believe it was, till the fifth grade, and she grew up in Los Angeles. And that's ridiculous, okay? You're born and raised in this country, but you're in a uh, Hispanic area and you know you still don't know it. So therefore what my point is, is that we have to offer free community college, English speaking classes for those that would desire it. To comment on that a little bit, um, my family came from Mexico and I have plenty of family and friends that have come from other different places. And for instance, one of my really close family friends, uh, they're a couple, he's Armenian and his wife is Ukrainian and their goal was to make their child that much more um, desirable by jobs and, and whatever else by teaching them only Armenian and only Ukrainian from the parents and then they learn English through school. I don't necessarily think that in all cases that's just you choosing not to learn the language of English um, in the sense that it might be an advantage for a child to be bilingual, trilingual by the age of, you know, 10. So there are there are circumstances in which uh, that does not necessarily apply. Well, there, there are advantages, but this is something that would gall me. Now, I'm Italian, OK, primarily Italian. And at one juncture, I lived in you know, an Italian neighborhood up in New York City. And I'm talking now as a child. This really got me aggravated. Uh, my landlord, we lived in an apartment and he would read the newspaper called Il Progresso. OK, now you don't have to know how to speak Italian to know what Il Progresso means, the progress. If they're living in this country for 20 years and you can't read an English newspaper, it disgusts you. It's like, what type of progress are you looking for? OK, I have no problem with heritage. Heritage is fantastic. I still do a lot of Italian heritage things. OK, that's great. But you have to assimilate into the country. If you don't assimilate, if you can't speak, read, or write that language, you're never going to move ahead. You're going to be stuck in your own little shell, in your own little world with your own friends, and, and you're not going to actually advance. 
I mean, you, the bottom line is, is you have to be able to assimilate into this country. And, you know, New York is probably the biggest melting pot in the world. OK, but, you know, you still have to go in and assimilate. Again, I believe I'm the best uh, uh, candidate. I have experience. I have motivation. I have passion. Uh, I have desire to go and help people in the state. Uh, I don't believe that my opponent has any of the above. And uh, so therefore, I think I'd be the best representative. Uh, you could contact me on Gmail, which is P-A-L-M-E-R. F O R A D seven at gmail.com. I'm still setting up my website, which would be Palmer for assembly.com. Uh, and I'm always out there and available for anybody to contact me and give me your thoughts and uh, views on what you need, especially my constituents. And you'd like to see uh, me try to do when I make the assembly. Okay, thank you very much, Tony. And that will conclude our endorsement interview for Nevada Assembly District 7.